Well, again, you, um, you're, you're one of the people who can actually say they, you know, actually learn from Mrs. Takata. So I think that's very special, and uh, that's why we wanted to talk to you today. Well, that's fine. Um, I did learn from her, but it was just a one-day class. No, I guess it was an evening and a day, mm -hmm. and then she left. So I didn't have a lot of interaction with her, just the attunement. But then, then the people that she had, she had uh, made 22 masters when I met her. And so then I, I learned more from some of her masters. Okay. What year was it that you took your level one? 1980. Oh, was it? Okay. Gotcha. The same she passed. I took it from her in the spring and she passed in the fall. Oh, wow. Okay. She was 80 when she passed. Yes, yes. With a little dynamo, though. I had no idea she was that old. Oh, wow. It, she was really an experience. Okay. And you, very, um, very impersonal, but she was, uh, she was a great storyteller. Okay. Yeah. Well, could you tell us a, you know, a little bit of what she was like? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, how I came to Reiki was I had a, just a spontaneous attunement, not knowing what was happening to me. I had gone to a meeting uh, to hear about, I didn't know anything about Reiki. I wanted to hear a performance they were doing. It was an entertainment thing sponsored by this particular church. It was a spiritualist church. And before they ha introduced the performer, they, uh, the woman who came out's name was Fran Brown, who's also written a book about Takata. And she did a meditation, which I had done many, many times uh, before. And I'd always done it in my head. And when she did it, <laughs> my entire spine got hot. And then I could feel energy moving out from my spine in like like a thousand tiny little filaments it wasn't like a blast of energy and it just moved out and i could feel it in the room and i thought what the heck is happening <laughs> and so after everything was over i went up to someone who was there and said what goes on in this church and they said oh we're a reiki healing center and that's how i got introduced to reiki wow. so i thought well i guess i better find out more so i went back twice but the, the Fran Brown was never there again. Another woman was, and that was uh, Fran. Um, that was um, Gray. Uh, what was her name? Fran Brown and Beth Gray. Mm -hmm. And Beth Gray did not have an energy that I was attracted to at all. She was kind of very, um, just a very different energy than Fran. So I just kind of let it go. And then about six or eight months later, a friend of mine, it was summertime, and she, I guess I took it, yeah, it was, it was a few months. And she was taking a class at San Francisco State on sound and color healing. And her teacher was George Araki, another master that was made a master by Takata. And um, so he, he said his, his master was teaching a class and he urged his class to go. And so then she called me and said, well, isn't, Reiki, what you had that experience with? And I said, yeah. And so we said, hey, we're going. So that's how we went. But the class was about, I don't know, I can't remember how. It was a very large class. It was at least 40 people. And so it was, um, I don't know how to say it. it. was. It was just not what I had expected, having absolutely no idea there was going to be this ritual that we had no introduction to. So when she... <laughs> When the ritual was performed, it was different than the way we do it now. But she lined up four people in a room. She'd take them four at a time. And then she had three masters with her. And they all wore bracelets that had jingles on them. And so they, they have you close your eyes. And at that time, your whole, your whole attunement was this way. And my friend and I, we, we, we are not coming from this orientation at all. And we're looking at each other, well, what have we gotten into? And so they did this whole thing, and all we remembered was, you know, uh, all this wishing of, of movement, and then slapping of hands and jingling bells, and we had no idea what was going on. There had been no, no, no introduction, no way to prepare you for this ritual. Uh, so that was probably one of the most uh, combination of mystical and hilarious experiences I'd ever had. And so that, that was just put me in the mood to find out more. 
So what she did after everyone was attuned, she had us all make a great big circle in the room. And she put a, a, had a table down in the center of the room and did a demonstration of how to do Reiki. And that was the sum total of my training. <laughs> there was, you know, she told the history. She told her history, the history from uh, Dr. Asui and Dr. Hayashi. And um, then she had us all put our hands on each other's shoulders and send the energy around the room so that we knew we had it. And that was it. So that was, the, you know, I just didn't know anything after that except what she had told us. There was no manual. And um, I did remember the, you know, I, I somehow or another, we did remember the, the positions because they were logical, mm -hmm. you know, start here. She started in the, in the center of the body. I have evolved to always start at the head because I get information when I start at the head. But, um, but I loved it. And, and then George Araki was having a practice. And so, well, the first practice I went to by myself was in Palo Alto and I learned nothing because everybody talked in Japanese. Mm. And they, every once in a while they'd say, oh, she doesn't speak funny, but mostly I didn't learn anything. So when, she, when my friend told me George was doing a practice, we went up to, I think it was like in South City. And um, that was very, that I learned a lot that night, mostly kinesthetically. I learned, I learned it kinesthetically. There was no written material then. And uh, he did say, you have a really good touch, which made me feel good because I wasn't feeling it myself. I had felt the attunement, but I wasn't feeling the transmission. So that gave me a lot of encouragement and I just went on from there on my own. And then um, I only did level one for a while because I was working. And so I had clients, I think mostly at night or on weekends. And then uh, at a certain point, I just knew I had to do this. And in the meantime, I had studied to be a hypnotherapist, and my practice was getting bigger, and I was combining the two things. And um, so I quit my job, and that's when I really uh, went in, into it, and I took second degree from Fran Brown. And Fran Brown, the, again, it was very different than the way we do it nowadays. She, um, she met with me and evidently her thing was she would interview you to see if she thought that you should be taking level two. And then she gave you the symbols and told you to learn them and, and she wrote them out. And then she said, you have to return them to me at, the, at our next meeting, which was a couple of days later. And I gave them to her and she ripped them up. <laughs> and you know how fun it is to learn the hunches they you know, right when you're new and it's new to you. Anyway, uh, I had copied it down for myself, which we weren't supposed to do, but I, I didn't think I'd remember it, so I did. Meanwhile, um, how she taught level two is very different than the way we teach it today, too. And uh, she did not really explain much about long distance healing other than have you do a session with a pillow on your lap. But there was there, there was just a lot left out. So I, I learned a lot of what I've learned simply by trial and error with myself. The one thing I learned how you, as a, I, I'm a sensitive or an empath, and nobody talked anything about picking up energies. Mm -hmm. So my first patient was a cancer patient, and uh, a friend of a friend who, the two friends of mine had recommended this one person to me, so she came. And she was in the midst of chemo, and at that time, I didn't even have a table yet, so she was on a couch, and I was kneeling on the floor. And I was feeling fine and I put my hands on her abdomen and I got so nauseous. And it took me three sessions with her before I made the connection that I must be taking on her discomfort from the chemotherapy. Mm. And so, you know, so all of this led me to include a lot more in my trainings with people. Mm. But that's essentially, um, to go back to Mrs. Takata, she told the traditional story that we have in America that, that Dr. Asui had studied it in a Christian ministry or a Christian church, uh, that um, the things that were inaccurate was that. And she made a very uh, colorful story about his awakening on the mountain, mm. which now a lot of that is left out. 
So there were things, and the main thing was um, she talked about the cost, and the cost still is in the um, in the Reiki Alliance. It's still uh, quite heavy to to take the Reiki train, ten thousand dollars. But in those days, nineteen eighty, ten thousand dollars was like a million. So I never aspired to be a Reiki master um, because of that. And in order to be in Fran's uh, group, you had to be invited, and she never invited me. So I don't know what that meant. You know, it's just like she just left me on my own. And um, Mrs. Takata did said the thing that really struck me, and I've told people who are sort of annoyed about the, the cost that she, she placed. But her reason was she was doing this in America and people did not respect the ritual. Partly, I think maybe because she didn't explain it, but also they, she said they don't value that part of Reiki. And she said, so I, and she always told her stories in first person. I ask myself, think in my head, what do Americans really value? Aha! money. <laughs> and so, I mean, she really was dynamic. And so that to me made sense because we were only a few, you know, we were a decade or so out of the second world war, but there was still antipathy toward Japanese. And so I could understand how she did that. And um, let's see what else. Um, Well, her story, actually her story about the, the uh, trip on, on Mount Kuriyama really held for a long, long time. It's only recently with some of the research that's been done that yeah. that's seen a little bit differently. So whether that had been told to her or whether that's something that was an embellishment, I don't know. Okay. So mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to understand the times and what she was up against to understand some of the things that people are dishing her about. Did she ever tell you her personal story? Yes, she did, and that was very interesting. She, um, she was of Japanese descent, but lived in Hawaii with her husband who had died, and she had two children, and she was raising the children there. They, I, he had been um, on one of the plantations, the pineapple planted, a worker. And after he died, she became ill, and she knew she had to go back home to Japan to, um, to take care of what was wrong with her. She didn't say what was wrong with her. I've read in several, uh, several things over different people's writings. But whatever it was, she was told she was gonna have to have surgery. And so she was, according to her, she was in the surgeon's office and, um, no, let's see how it was. No, she was actually being prepared for surgery. And she was, uh, lying there and they I guess she was in pre-op and she hears this voice that says to her there's another way and she said I just didn't pay attention to it and she said but the voice came back and said there's another way and she still she didn't know what she could do about that and finally it said very dramatically get off the table there's another way and so when the doctor came back she told him about it and he said, well, there is this healing clinic run by Dr. Hayashi across town. So she, or maybe it was, that was not the doctor, I take it back. It was the nurse who came in who told mm -hmm. her that. And so, um, so she just decided that's it. She got dressed and found out how to get there and went and appealed to him uh, to take her on. And, and he did. And in those days, evidently, they worked with multiple tables and multiple practitioners, and they just, so she was worked on, I guess, every day, if I can remember right, and ultimately was healed. Oops, excuse me, I have to turn that off. Oh, that. I, I didn't know how to get back. Um, so she had that healing and she was so impressed but the funny the funny part of her story was when she was put on and you've probably read this in other books mm -hmm. she was put on the table and she she could feel the vibration and she was sure that they had something up their sleeve 
but to hear her tell it had us rolling on the floor because she was a good storyteller. And so she'd say, I look up their sleeve. She goes like that because she thought there'd be a battery there or whatever. Anyway, uh, she finally realized that this was really a beautiful healing art and she petitioned to be trained in it. Now, according to her, she was told that uh, she couldn't because she was not Japanese and they didn't want Reiki to go out of Japan. They wanted to keep it in, in its national home. And, but she, she said, and again, her, her way of telling the story, she says, well, I go home and I think to myself, what way can I get them to take me? What, what would make it sound really like they should? Oh, I know. I get the doctor to write a note to Mr. or Dr. Asui. And so she did. I mean, she really got to hand it to her because that's not typical of Japanese women in that era. No. She goes back and she gets the letter written and Dr. Asui accepts her. And that's how she got mm. into being trained. This was to be trained in Reiki, not to be healed. This was post the healing. And so she did, but he, they, didn't, they didn't have trainings then. You know, I mean, Dr. Asui was the one who brought, that's just the, the message. He's the one who really re-brought, according, according to the story as I heard it, re-brought into Japan the Reiki healing. Mm. And the way I heard it, and in, I think in Fran's book and a couple of others, it was thought that it had been, it, it's an ancient healing art, whether it was called Reiki or not, but people had lost how you mm. you received it and, and initiated. Right. And so, um, where was I going with that? <laughs> mm. um, well, that Dr. Rasui had given permission. Yeah, he gave permission for her. You said there wasn't really training at that time. Oh, that was it. Thank you. Yeah, so he he just would... Um, up their Reiki by just touching them mm. and doing a meditation. And he taught the Reiki in the middle of the trainings, it, what they called them, uh, they didn't call them attunements, empowerments that they mm. did normally anyway. So it became a part of the whole, um, the whole Buddhist ritual that people did when they met mm. together. And um, so, you know, it, it from there, I don't know where it went mm -hmm. in terms of, of training. Well, I don't know if Dr. Hayashi developed the symbols. Most of the literature I've read seems to say that he did. Yeah. But I don't know if that's true. I understand so, he, he came up with the modern hand positions, too, that we still use today. Yeah. yeah. Well, she used those hand positions, yeah. So I, I guess she, she learned them from him. She and he were pretty connected. Psychically, they, they could telepathically communicate with each other. And she did a lot of classes with him, evidently. Trainings, I guess they called them in Japan. And then when she was in Hawaii and set up her own trainings, he did come to Hawaii and did classes with her because she wasn't yet a master. So he would come to do the attunements. Yeah, and that, that's something not everybody writes about. Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so when you were in Mrs. Takata's class, did she have a specific format? Was it just more, you know, spur of the moment? Did she have a structure? Did she give you any <laughs> written material to take home in level one? No, that's what I said. We didn't get anything. Okay. We took, all I had was my notes. And her structure was simply to tell her stories and then put us into, you know, move, move the crowd four or six at a time mm -hmm. and move us in and out quite quickly toward the attunement with no explanation of the attunement and nothing beyond the history that she had shared. Mm -hmm. So she didn't give anything. I think she, well, I have to take that back. She did tell us the, the, in what each position covered. So like the pineal pituitary, you know, the, 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 wrote the heart and so on. She did give us that and demonstrated it. So okay. we did see 
but it was very unstructured otherwise. Okay. So if you had to pick one thing that uh, you took from Mrs. Takata's class, maybe some advice, uh, mm -hmm. one thing that she, was it, was there one thing that maybe stood out? Well, uh, it, the, the ritual stood out because it was something we had never experienced before. Mm -hmm. And that, that was very intriguing. But the one thing that worked for me personally, because I wasn't feeling the Reiki, even though I had felt the attunement, I didn't feel it when I was putting my hands out, but she had said over and over in the class, you must listen to your hands, mm -hmm. listen to your hands. And she, I don't think she digressed much on that, but it was something that stuck with me. So when I was doing Reiki, uh, because I couldn't tell in the beginning, I would ask, I would think it was working. So then I would say to my client, what do you feel? And they would say, oh, there's so much heat. And I'd go, oh, good. <laughs> you know, and uh, so that for me was, was a little um, mantra that kept me going, even though I couldn't really tell if it was actually working till I worked long enough to see results. And um, what else did I take from it? Mostly what I took from it was she was such a dynamic uh, teacher in, in that, or storyteller, really. And I was just so taken with the Reiki. It was like, I think I must have known Reiki in another lifetime because I had that attunement simply through a meditation by Fran, which then gave me a, a view of Reiki that says, Reiki is a universal experience that if you are in, attuned to it and in it, you don't have to do hand positions, especially once you've done a lot of Reiki. I do them because it feels so freaking good. <laughs> but you don't have to. I, I can, I can uh, work with people, well, easily. I mean, we do it by long distance, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, of course, you can do it without. But um, So those are the two things I took, was to trust the Reiki is there, to trust that my hands would eventually give me the answers. And, and the thing that helped was I didn't get the answers. No, I wouldn't say it that way. My hands didn't tell me anything. But as I learned to read the subtle energy, then I could tell. Mm -hmm. But that took a while. That took a few patients before I really trusted that I, I was picking up information because I wasn't getting telepathic information in the sense of actual words. Mm -hmm. It was more, and she did say this. She, she said, if your hands are here, well, somebody did. I have to say, I don't think that was Takata. Somebody else said that. If your hands are here and you're really wanting to move them, move them. Because that's them telling you that the body wants you to touch some other place. I'm not sure if that was Takata or Fran. Okay. Yeah. So um, a few of the 42 masters um, obviously stayed in contact with Mrs. Takata. Um, mm -hmm. They started branching out there on their own. Mm -hmm. um, are they still around? Do you know? Are they still alive? Yeah. Still uh, well, they, uh, some of them are. Uh, many of them are not still alive. Mm -hmm. they still were more her age. But as far as I know, Georgia Rocky is still uh, teaching. He was younger. Mm -hmm. Iris, I don't know about. My lineage does include her. My my master degree is under her lineage. Uh, Fran Brown has passed and Beth Gray has passed. Okay. And I don't know about, you know, the, the other thing about the, the alliance, this is post knowing Takata, mm -hmm. but the Reiki alliance, once she died, there was a lot of uh, unexpected rivalry mm -hmm. and mean spiritedness about who was going to be the grand master. Now, Frank Petter and, and, um, uh, whoever else he wrote that book with, they said there never was a Reiki Grandmaster. That was something that Takata brought, brought here, I guess, to make it seem more impressive. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it, it, and so I never joined the Reiki Alliance. Okay. It just seemed too competitive and too, everybody was fighting with everybody else. I don't, Fran, Fran Brown and Beth Gray didn't seem to stay together, even though they had been mm -hmm. partners. In, uh, and Beth Gray was John, uh, was John Gray's wife. Mm. And 
she had an enormous practice in Redwood City up here in Northern California. And I never heard anything about what happened to John after they divorced. So I don't know whether he continued practicing or not. But she she had a very strong practice and she was very psychic. And she drew a lot of people who were psychic and she taught a lot of psychic stuff, which is one of the things that kept me from being too interested in her because I wasn't psychic. <laughs> Highly intuitive, but I, I don't. I, well, I guess you would say in today's world, I'm clairsentient, but at the time, there was no draw there, so I, I don't know too much more about her, but she was very popular. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and let's see. Um, oh, hold on a minute. My cat is... Okay, she's going blink, 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 blink. Um, let's see. You had other questions. And I, I printed them out, so I... Well, actually, you've covered quite a few. Um... I guess the other thing that um, I would like to know is what was kind of the Reiki atmosphere in the 70s? Was, oh, yeah. How did yeah. it gain popularity? Um, <laughs> how did you <laughs> even find Mrs. Takata, you know, and others? Well, I think that, yes, the, it was very hidden. I mean, you didn't talk about being a Reiki person unless you already knew the person was not going to freak out. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was working at a place called the Children's Health Council at the time. And, and that, it was a wonderful place. It still is. It's multidisciplinary to help children with all the different problems children can have from psychological to uh, speech and language to needing special schooling. And because I, had, I was so excited about this and the people there, I started having them become clients. So then some of the people would start calling me when they'd say, do you have a minute? Uh, you know, I'd say, why? Well, I have a headache. Can you come and do that stuff on me? <laughs> so, yeah, I began to get confident with people that I didn't know. And uh, it helped the teachers of those kids a lot because they all had very challenging children to work with. Um, so, in the, but in terms of, I had had a meditation group for years and we, I had learned other healing modalities because I didn't think I could afford to do Reiki, Reiki mastery. So I did Reiki, but I couldn't teach it. So I, I, this is part of my story now. I had a niece who was dying of cancer and she lived out in Modesto. So I, when I went out and my daughter lived out there, when I went out to visit my daughter, I would go work on my niece. And she got great help from it because she had a lot of discomfort. And so I said, we've got to find somebody who can, can work with her regularly because I wasn't there. She needed weekly treatment or more. And so my daughter got online and, and found, um, a, I think it was a bookstore in Tracy, which is fairly in the area there. And it turned out that there was a Reiki master out there. Mm. He had been trained by Janine Sandy, who was in Iris Ishikura's lineage so i thought well i'm going to call her so i called her and she said oh yes she was going to have a master class and so i said well can i take it from you i'll be i'd be willing to travel out here and stay at my daughter's to do that now a bridge back my understanding with the reiki alliance is they they had you had to take a year or more to become a reiki master whether it was an apprenticeship or I don't know, but they, it was not, and you couldn't ask for it. You had to be invited to it. So I was, that's why I asked her, would you, can I train? Well, Iris had had a different view. She lived out there in the Valley where people didn't have a lot of money. And so she lowered the cost. So instead of $10,000, I got my ranking mastery for $1,000. Mm -hmm. And it was, again, <laughs> the training lacked a lot because she had, there were four of us, I think, and she had us come on a Friday night and she gave us the symbol and told us the, the transmission process, which was very complicated at that time. And um, then the next day she had a class, uh, the next two days, I guess it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The next two days she had a Reiki 1 and Reiki 2 class combined. And so she had us, her Reiki masters, who had just learned the symbols and the transmission. And she just says, okay, you take that side and I'll take this side. And it was like, oh. 
I was up all night memorizing and how to do this thing. It was so it was really not the way I decided to teach it. But anyway, I I, I got the attunement and I learned how to do the transmission. And one of the things I, I did learn that I drove back to my to Mrs. Takata was I was standing there at the front position after doing the, the head and I started to draw the daikunio <laughs> and I got it totally mixed up with the Hanchasicho man. And I got panicked and I thought, oh, this person's not gonna get attuned. And I took a deep breath and thought, okay, just settle down. And I felt that symbol drop out of my hand. I honestly felt it drop out. So that was like an amazing experience. Back to Takata's Listen to Your Hands. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I did train with her, but I, I just knew that I was not going to train that way, that I felt people needed more time yeah. and more in, in level two and, and, and in mastery. Sure. So I've got my own way of doing it now. And I usually, when I was in the Bay Area and people could come, uh, frequently, I, I did a year long apprentice. I tuned them at about nine months and then we had three months of practice afterwards. Mm -hmm. Now that I live up in Northern California and in, in unknown to me, the most conservative <laughs> area in Northern California, I don't find too many people fascinated by Reiki. Mm -hmm. So most of mine have to come up from the Bay Area, which is, you know, a three hour ride back and forth. So I've cut it shorter, but but I liked it that way. It felt really good, and and I ha and I would teach them things that I knew I would have liked to have had, like mm -hmm. how do you protect yourself <laughs> if you're clairsentient, which most a whole lot of people drawn to Reiki are, and they're empathic. How do you not pick up from your client? You know, and those are things I learned in other trainings, and um, and they they seem to love having a long time to deepen in, in how to work with people before they get attuned to train. Transference was one thing that was never taught. And mm -hmm. I've seen people who teach who are clearly transferring to their, to their students. You know, they're, they're, not, um, they're not staying in their own space. So, so that's mine has evolved that way. And the other thing that's happening now is is everybody's putting their own signature on Reiki. Yes. Because everybody's got so many different things they've trained in that they bring to it. And Reiki is universal. So it can flow through any channel that you have open. Yes. And so, yeah. Any other question? No, yeah, well, that's great. Uh, but I've seen a lot of what you're talking about recently, the, the splintering, I call it, where, you know, people will add a little bit of their own twist, and now mm -hmm. all of a sudden they claim it's another branch, you know. Yeah, well, I've never done that. I do channel other frequencies, but I know, like, William Rand has the fire Reiki and the Karuna Reiki. Right, right. Uh, to me, Reiki is Reiki. Well, my last count, I think there was between 25 and 30 claimed Reiki systems. So I agree with you, though. Reiki is just Reiki. Yeah, I, I, yeah Reiki is Reiki. Yeah. That's, the, that's the person's personality on it, which is okay, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's still, you know, you can't own something that's universal. Right, right, right. You know, so that's why I have never put a name on mine. I just call it Reiki. Right. Is it just means really basically the universal energy coming into form, Reiki, mm -hmm. into the energy of the of the um, manifested world. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. I mean, I've attuned uh, Catholic nuns, and I just mm -hmm. put a little bit of a, a you know I use I use the universal idea to say, you know if if you can understand this better by translating it through the Christ consciousness, it's, you know, it's coming from those dimensions that are unseeable mm -hmm. that we think we know something about. We really don't. <laughs> so, you know, you, you keep it simple. Yeah. Keep it. Yeah. Don't, don't clutter it up with your own ego and, and your own uh, idea that you're better than somebody else or know more than somebody else. So, you know, I'm more, I have a much more intuitive way of working. I'm, I am logical too, but I mean, I just, 
I have because I'm clairsentient. I feel more than I think. Mm -hmm. In 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 uh, in the work. I mean, I, I don't consciously think what's happening here. I just pay attention to it, and then I just know something. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Um, once again, I want to thank you for your time. Yeah. So, uh, as I wrote to you in the email, uh, this is very enlightening because you were there. You know, yeah. others like me read books and, and uh, get our information from websites, but you were yeah. there. And that's extremely yeah, valuable. I, yeah, she was really very, very old. She, uh, I know that she had a huge uh, field energy. Uh, I did not. She did not work on us, so I don't know what it would have felt like if I was on the table with her. I only know what it was like to receive the attunement. But the dynam the really dynamic experience was the, the spontaneous attunement, which mm. really came from Fran Brown. Mm. Right. So, okay. you know, and uh, there's probably other things right now my mind is swimming with it but there are probably other things i could tell you that would be interesting well uh, look at a couple. i'd love to continue this at another time <laughs> yeah another time i'm looking where uh, it's yeah. for. so um again but I, I really appreciate this time this is was a great start um i would I still definitely love to pick your brain a little bit more and uh we will certainly <laughs> uh hopefully talk soon oh well and you just let me know okay well, thank you so much, Terry. Terry Atwood, thank you again. Um, it's been a real, uh, real pleasure. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye.